this, this is puzzling. The pieces don't fit. The members of the Sanhedrin, the, the high court, the, the supreme court, if you will, have met together to decide what to do with this new group of believers, now numbering well into the thousands. They've been meeting in the temple in, the, in, the, in the, what's called Solomon's Colonnade. It was that porched area that I showed you in a picture last week. That roofed area of the temple. And their numbers every day are growing. Every day they're getting more attention. Every day they're getting more people. Every day there's, there's more interest in hearing about this new life. And as the religious leaders convene, well, they know that this has to come to an end. This new church has got to be stopped. It is, it is a direct threat to their power, to their prestige, to their authority. So they gather together in, in long flowing robes and, and they're all seated in their, their seats of high honor. And they sent for the apostles to be brought to them from the jail cells where they've been held. They were, they were arrested the day before and, and, and thrown into jail until the Sanhedrin could get together. But as the captain of the guard goes to retrieve them from their jail cells, he finds the, the doors are all locked and the guards are standing outside, but there's no one inside the jail cells. And he does his best to explain this situation to the high priests at the Sanhedrin. And the Bible says they are puzzled. The pieces aren't fitting together. We're continuing our study this morning in the book of Acts. And, and we're up to chapter 5 this morning. We're, we're going to conclude a story that we began last week. A story that had the apostles arrested and thrown into jail for preaching under the name of Jesus Christ. But in the night, an angel had come and opened the doors and told the men in Acts chapter 5, verse 20, we talked about this last week, the angel said, go and stand in the temple courts and tell all the people all about this new life. And so early at dawn the next morning, that's exactly what they did, right back to the same spot that they had been arrested and as the religious leaders, the, the Sanhedrin convenes that morning, they receive news that, that the apostles are not to be found in their jail cells. And that's where we pick up the story this morning, beginning in verse 25. Acts chapter 5, starting at verse 25. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. After that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. So once again, the captain of the guard goes to get the apostles. This time not to the jail cell. This time he goes out to the temple courts. But this time, well, you've got to ask him kind of nicely. Now remember, they're teaching and preaching, and, and they're surrounded by literally thousands of people. And so the guard goes up and he says, hey guys, I, I know we arrested you a couple of days ago, but this time could you just come with us? We're not going to grab you. We're not going to use force because you got numbers on your side. And the apostles, instead of using the crowd as a, as a shield, instead of hiding behind their numbers, they gladly go with government and authority. Verse 27, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Oh, church, do you, do you catch the irony here? You don't want to miss this. Let me ask you a simple question. If you locked up a group of men and you had them guarded under lock and key and the next morning the doors are still locked, the guards are still outside, but the men are nowhere to be found and you finally track them down, they're brought before you, what's the first question you're going to ask? How'd you do that? Where'd you go? 
How did you pull that off? But that's not what they ask, is it? Why? Because the religious leaders know there's a miracle that has just happened. They don't want to ask the question because they already know the answer. So instead, here's what they ask. Why did you go back to teaching? We told you not to teach in his name. Why are you stirring everyone up and and, and trying to put the guilt on us for killing this Jesus? And watch how the apostles answer them. Verse 29. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We're witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. I love it. The apostles are are cool as a cucumber. They're like, you know what? We'll, We'll obey government. We will follow government up to a point. And when the government says, hey, we want to arrest you again, we'll go. We won't cause a scene. We won't cause a disturbance. But, and church, we we need to hear this in our world today. But, when following our government directly goes against what it means to follow God, mm -mm. we're going to follow God every time. You see, the apostles make it clear who the highest ruling authority is, and it's not the Sanhedrin. It's not the Supreme Court. It isn't the president or the governor. It is and it always will be God, period. And let me tell you the story, they say. It is Jesus Christ who you crucified, who you hung on the cross with nails, but God raised him from the dead and made him prince and savior. And he's come for repentance and to give you forgiveness so that the Holy Spirit might be in you. And there you have the story. We began it last week. We finish it up today. A story of courage, a story of of faith, a story of of, of standing up for what you believe in, even if it means going against the government, even if it means facing arrest. And last week, I gave you the first of the life lessons from this passage. A proclamation from the heaven that that applied to them 2,000 years ago, but man, look around you. It, it, It could very easily apply to us today. You don't have to write the first one on your note sheet. I've already done that for you because we did it last week. But let's go back and review it one more time. It's not about what they did. It's about who they were with. We read stories in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and now, of course, we're in the book of Acts. And and man, we just see these guys are not special. These guys were not not together. They are not people that we need to admire. They, They didn't have it together. They're... They're fishermen, they're tax collectors, they're liars, they're cheats. But because of the grace and love of God, they began walking with Jesus. But even then they didn't get it right. But these people give me hope. Because if God can use someone as messed up as Peter or James or John, then God can certainly use someone as messed up as Bill. I don't have to be wonderful or great. I don't have to be, try to pretend to be something I'm not because I have found a wonderful and great God. And secondly, and the rest of these you do have to write down, God works for His purpose and glory and not ours. This story is a great example of that, of how God works for His purpose and His glory and not ours. Think about this for a minute, and, and, and it's going to get a little, a little tough. So I really want you to follow along with me on this. Why did God step in and do a miracle in this case? Why did God send an angel to open that jail cell and lead those apostles out? Was it, was it because he felt sorry for them sitting in jail and, and he, he just wanted to, to make them comfortable? No. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it was because 
he knew they'd been treated unjustly. And, and you know, God is a social justice warrior, so he wants to, to make things right for them. No. Listen, the only reason God did a miracle here is because he wanted his message to continue to be preached. Period. It wasn't about saving these guys. It wasn't about making them comfortable. No, he puts them right back into the fire, doesn't he? He gets them out of jail and says, I want you to go right back to where you were arrested and do it again. He took them out and said, go right back into your problem. I need you on the front lines. Listen, for those of you who haven't read ahead, I hate to give away the end of the book, but I got a spoiler alert for you. These apostles aren't going to be living much longer. The reason why God stepped in, the reason why God is doing great things is because he has a purpose in their life. We can apply this to us and where we are today. You say, but wait, Bill, it was an angel that opened up the jail cells, right? Yes, it was. It was an angel that commanded them to go out and preach to all the people about a new life, right? Yes, it was. Well, guess what? I've never been commanded by an angel. Haven't you? I don't need an angel to command me. When I have the words of Jesus that says, you're going to be salt and light. I don't need an angel to command me. When, when, when I have, the, I have the, the written word of God that says that I am to die to myself, to pick up my cross, and to follow Jesus. I don't need an angel to command me to go in and tell all the people about, about God. Because I have something called a great commission. I don't even need an angel to tell me what my purpose in life is. Because the entire New Testament tells me, you have been saved to save others. We can think about it this way, and, and, and it's number three on your sheet. God wants to give you a new life. We touched on this a little bit last week. God wants to give you a new life. I want to make sure you don't miss this. God wants to give you a new life, not, not make your old life better. It's not about us getting a better life. It's not about us getting an improved life. It's not about me becoming a better Bill. God wants to give me a new life. It's not about cleaning yourself up because you can't. It is Christ, and Christ alone, who died and rose again to give his life to us and put his life in us. And I want you to write it down this way, number four on your outline. Christ exchanged his life for ours so that we can exchange our life for his. Did you get that? Christ exchanged his life for ours. He died so I wouldn't have to. He gave his life for mine so that the repentance and the forgiveness that these guys talked about in verse 31, so that we could exchange our life for his. It is what Jesus told everyone that was following him over and over again. Anyone can follow me. All you got to do is give up on you, pick up your cross, and follow me. It is a new life. And the angel shows up at the jail cells and says, now go tell everyone. Go tell everyone about his, this, this new life. He gave his life for us so that he could put his life in us. And if we miss this, we miss it all. Why were the apostles arrested? Well, they were arrested for teaching in the temple, right? What had they been told by the government not to teach in the temple in the name of Jesus Christ? And by the way, this is the second time they've been arrested. The first time they were let go by the Sanhedrin. The second time the angel comes and opens their jail cell. And so what did they do? They, they, they've, been, they've been freed two different times from jail. They go home and sit back in their lazy boy and pop open a cold one? No. The next morning, dawn, they're down there preaching and teaching again. 
So many times we look at this and we go, man, God did a miracle in opening up those jail cells. Why don't we ever see anything like that today? Why don't, why don't we see God doing, working like this today? Oh, oh, friends, I do believe God still works in amazing, amazing ways. I still pray for miracles. Over the last two weeks, I've lost four clients and good friends to something called COVID-19. We lost our church treasurer to COVID-19. We lost, we, we had three of our staff members infected with COVID-19. My friends, I am praying like crazy that, that this whole COVID thing would just be gone. I am. I am praying that. But here's what I do know about reading Scripture. Here's why miracles happen. They happen for God's kingdom, not ours. God worked a miracle in the life of these apostles not to make them more comfortable, not to make their lives easier. God said, look, I did a miracle to put you back into the frying pan. I did a miracle to get you back to teaching so that when the world comes to get rid of you, I'm going to do a miracle to put you right back into the front lines, right back into the battle. I know this is tough, but let me ask you something. Are you praying for something so that God would make your life better? Are you praying for something so that someone you love, or, or, or maybe for yourself, that, so that you could be more comfortable? Are you praying for someone that you love or for, for yourself so you, so you don't have to face a hardship? Do you see the difference here? The miracle wasn't to make his followers comfortable. The miracle was to advance the kingdom of God. In fact, he put them right back to where it's not comfortable. By the end of this chapter, they will be stoned and beaten for what they're teaching. God did not work a miracle for them to relieve their suffering. The miracle was to keep them in the battle, on the front lines. May I remind you what happens to every one of these apostles? Matthew will be beheaded with a sword. Mark is going to die in Alexandria after being drugged through the streets of the city. Luke will be hanged on an olive tree in Greece. John will die a natural death, the only one of the apostles that does, but they still try to boil him in oil. Peter will be crucified upside down in Rome. Stephen, in a couple more chapters, is about to be stoned to death. James will be beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Lesser will be thrown from a cliff and then beaten with clubs as he lay there crippled. Philip will be hanged. Bartholomew will be whipped and beaten until dead. Andrew will be crucified and will preach at the top of his lungs until his executioners kill him. Thomas will be run through by a spear. Jude will be killed by the arrow of an executioner. Matthias will be stoned and beheaded. Barnabas will be stoned and beheaded. And Paul will be beheaded in Rome. Jesus didn't show up and say, I'm doing a miracle to give you a long and healthy and happy life. He did a miracle to put them on the front lines. He's advancing his kingdom, not ours. And I know it's tough to say this, but so many of us pray for miracles. And, and, and guys, believe me, I am right there with you. I pray for miracles so that, so that those people I love would have a better life. But that doesn't seem to be the point of miracles in the Bible, does it? Oh, friends, we need to understand this. These guys were set free so they could go out and set others free. I love that they didn't run away. Next morning, they're right back in the battle. And let me close this morning with this story. And, and at first, it's going to seem completely unrelated, but I promise you, I promise you it's going to make sense in just a minute. We've all heard of the ship, the Titanic. Things didn't go well for the Titanic. We kind of know that. It was known as an unsinkable ship right up until the moment that it struck an iceberg. And it sank. April 15th, 1912. Let me give you some, some important numbers about this tragedy in our human history. 1,503, 
That's the number of people that died in this disaster. 705. That's the number that survived. But now let me give you a few more numbers that you probably don't know and numbers that I find really puzzling. 48. 48 is the number of lifeboats that were originally planned for the Titanic by the chief designer Alexander Carlyle. He designed the Titanic to hold 48 lifeboats. Well, here's another number, 20. 20 is the number of actual lifeboats that were on board the Titanic because it was afraid that, that it would be too cluttered. It, would, it was determined by the, by the, uh, the, the White Star Lines that, that it, would, it would be an inconvenience to have 48 lifeboats. It would be an eyesore. So they went with 20 instead. Here's another number, 28. 28 is the number of people on that very first lifeboat that hits the water. It's called lifeboat number seven. Each lifeboat had its own separate number designation. Number seven hits the, ground, hits the water, 28 people on board. The lifeboats have a capacity of 65. 28 was how many got on that first lifeboat. Most of the passengers didn't think that there was any need to get on board a lifeboat. The Titanic could not sink. And so they resisted. Let me give you another number, 12. Lifeboat number one is lowered about an hour after the iceberg uh, strikes, or after the Titanic strikes the iceberg. Lifeboat number one is lowered, 12 people aboard. It'll hold 65 and only 12 were in it. Five first class passengers and seven crew members to serve them. The press would later call this boat the millionaire's boat because they were accused of ignoring the cries of the people in the water. Here's another number, 472. 472 is the number of empty spaces in all the lifeboats that were actually used. And maybe, maybe the most staggering number of all, one. One is the number of lifeboats that actually returned to the wreckage trying to save others. All the other lifeboats stayed away. Only one lifeboat came back to save the others. Why? Well, the other lifeboats were afraid that they would be overwhelmed with, with desperate survivors who would do anything to try to get on their, board, on their boat. And so they took it easy. And they played it safe. And, and they rode away. Why am I telling you this? My friends, we are not saved to row away in comfort, waiting someday for someone to come along and pick us up. We are saved to save others. The story we've spent the last two weeks on, a group of men that had been locked up in jail, the very moment they're, they're released, what did they do? They go right back to saving others. That's why we exist. And heaven itself says, you have to tell people about this new life. It is the life of Christ in us. You are saved simply to save others. There's a quote I heard this week. Man, it really hit home for me. And it goes like this. I fear for the salvation of anyone who doesn't fear for the salvation of someone else. Man, if we, if we truly understand what it is we're being saved from, why wouldn't we want to share that? Why wouldn't we want to tell others? That is the proclamation of God. That is the declaration of us. And as we close this morning, I promise you, I, I want to pray for all of us that know Christ, that God might put someone we know heavy on our heart and in our minds this morning. I'm going to pray that God would put somebody who doesn't know Christ in our path this week, someone who doesn't have this eternal promise, someone who doesn't have the Spirit in their life, I'm going to pray that God gives us the boldness and the faith that we can, in our own way, in our own voice, just say, man, I, I really want to share this with you. Let's together remember, we're saved to save others. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for this church. And by church, I don't mean crossroads. I mean this church that we're reading about. Because we're a part of it. Father, I thank you that each and every one of us are a part of the kingdom of God. We've confessed our sin. We've repented and and asked you to come into our life. And we know that you are working in us and through us. And Father, thank you for allowing us to be the church. May we never set in our lifeboats and paddle away to our own comfort just looking for the day that we get picked up and rescued. May we always be the ones that are looking over the sides going, what about them? What about them? Father, I pray that you burden and break our hearts for the things that burden and break your hearts. And and God, give us the courage, give us the strength to share with others what it means to have a new life. And we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here this morning. Please come back next Sunday, but in the meantime, oh, Christian, tell others. Tell others why you're here. Tell others that you're a part of the battle. Tell others about this new life. God bless you.